mr president honourable members of the european parliament honourable members of the iraqi council of representatives and your excellency the ambassador from iraq salam aleikum. i am very happy to be here in brussels. it is a great privilege for me to have been invited to address this meeting. it brings back fond memories of five tense years that i spent in the chair of this delegation and the frequent visits that i paid to iraq. it is also a great privilege to pay my respects to my great friend and colleague david campbell bannerman who now chairs this delegation. it is very good to see that the work of this important delegation is in such good hands. during my last year in this parliament i formed an ngo a non profit organisation registered here in brussels called the european iraqi freedom association many iraqis encouraged me to continue to follow the situation in iraq and i am now trying to do that. the eifa facebook page now has more than forty six zero likes from mostly inside iraq and i am really grateful to those iraqis who have expressed sympathy and support for our work. i have tried to defend the people of iraq whether they are shia sunni kurds christians turkmen or a multitude of other ethnic minorities. i have tried to be quite blunt and outspoken in defending the rights of the iraqi and the iranian people and i have done this without fear of being on bad terms with the governments in power in these two countries because this is the price we decided to pay for our principles which is defending democracy and human rights. and i must say i have been under some considerable pressure and even accusations by the two regimes currently in power in iran and iraq. over the years i have become a target of numerous attacks and misinformation campaigns by the mullahs in Tehran and by, my, and by supporters of uh, Nouri al-Maliki in Baghdad. But the only thing I've gained is the sympathy and support of the people in these two countries who have suffered so much under Islamic fundamentalism. We've tried to be their voice in Europe and that's frankly enough for me. So today, please allow me to express my opinion and the views of the European Iraqi Freedom Association in the hope that our efforts will contribute to helping the people in Iraq, which of course is the subject of our meeting here today. The current war raging across Iraq was as avoidable as it was predictable. The war which has displaced hundreds of thousands, leaving Iraq with more than two million IDPs. Well, I can tell you when I was elected president of this delegation in 2009, I warned that Nouri al-Maliki's second term as prime minister, insisted upon by Iran and supported by the US and the EU, was a tragedy for the Iraqi people, for the region and for the world. As a puppet of the Iranian mullahs, he encouraged the Iranian-led militias and he used them to enforce his merciless iron fist sectarian policy of indiscriminate bombing, shelling, arbitrary arrest, torture and mass executions of innocent Sunni civilians. The Shias, Sunnis and Christians had lived together peacefully in Iraq for millennia. But with the Iranian regime's meddling, the sectarian war started, which of course is one of the main reasons for the rise and the growth of extremist groups like Daesh in Iraq. And we can say the same thing in Syria, where the mullahs in Tehran back Bashar al-Assad and where more than 300,000 people have been killed so far, the majority of them civilians. When Maliki was in power, the number of executions in Iraq rose to record levels and an increasing number of political opponents found themselves faced with trumped-up charges of terrorism. Many women are held in prison to this day in intolerable conditions. 
But we in the West stood aside and allowed Maliki to remain in office. And now we are witnessing the results of this catastrophic policy. The sudden emergence of Daesh became a convenient focal point enabling Maliki to accelerate his sectarian campaign against his political foes. Now, I understand that the Iraqi Commission of Integrity recently told the Iraqi Parliament, the Council of Representatives, that Maliki siphoned off $500 billion, $500 billion dollars during his term in office between 2006 and 2014. The report stated that nearly half of the Iraqi government's revenues during that eight-year period were stolen by Maliki. This was corruption on an industrial scale. Iraq is now considered as the most corrupt country in the Arab world, or indeed in the whole world, as Mr. Sadiq said earlier. Now, I fully appreciate that Hyder al-Abadi sacked Maliki as vice president in August this year as part of his reform package. But I have to ask the question, why has he not been arrested? Why has he not been indicted for crimes against humanity, genocide and venal corruption? On the contrary, Maliki still wields considerable power and still finances a private army. This is a disgrace and an offence against any attempt at reform. When Maliki came to power, step by step, his government got closer to Tehran. A clear indication of this was Maliki's approach towards the main Iranian opposition uh, members of the People's Mujahideen Organization of Iran, the PMOI or MEK. But from the first day after the fall of Saddam, Tehran had conspired to massacre their arch foe and to annihilate Camp Ashraf. And in Nuri al-Maliki, they found a willing tool. As the U.S. withdrew from Iraq, it handed over the protection of Ashraf to Maliki's government, having first signed an agreement with each and every individual resident in Ashraf, guaranteeing their safety and security in return for the surrender of their weapons. This amounted to signing the death warrant for these defenseless residents. The predictable outcome materialized in the form of six brutal massacres during the years 2009 to 2013 under Maliki's direct supervision, culminating in a seventh obscene rocket attack on the unarmed civilian refugees in Camp Liberty near Baghdad airport only a month ago on the 29th of October when more than 80 rockets rained down on the sleeping refugees, killing 24, horribly injuring many others. There was widespread destruction. The rockets were fired from a carefully planned position well within the tight security zone that surrounds the camp and the airport. And this attack would not have been possible without the direct collusion and involvement of the Iraqi authorities. Since 2009, over 140 residents of Ashraf and Liberty have been killed, with hundreds more maimed and severely injured. Since the attack, and all of the many expressions of concern from political leaders around the world, including even John Kerry, the Secretary of State, the Iraqi government has not only continued to suppress the refugees and Liberty, they have actually tightened the screw by denying access to food trucks, septic tanks, fuel tankers, trucks carrying essential materials to repair the hundreds of damaged huts and trailers, and 27 refugees have now died because of the ongoing brutal medical siege on the camp. The 2,200 residents who survived the massacre are now being subjected to even worse abuse, mistreatment, humiliation, Worse than ever before, there are numerous reports from Camp Liberty that agents of the Iranian regime's Ministry of Intelligence and Security, pretending to be relatives of the residents, are being brought by the National Security Advisor, Fala Fayaz, to the camp to collect intelligence for further terrorist operations. Well, I urge my colleagues in the Iraqi parliament 
to call for the immediate removal of Fale Fayaz because he is a symbol of the corrupt days of Maliki and he's also been indicted by the Spanish courts for offences against the international community. The sooner he goes, the better for the credibility of Iraq. The main problem in Iraq is the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime is using the war against Daesh to control Iraq. My advice to my brothers and sisters in Iraq is do not allow this to happen. Iraq is a great country. It deserves to be an independent country. It should be given a chance, inshallah, to be free of extremism. The fight against Daesh is a just and legitimate fight. We have to defeat Daesh in Syria and in Iraq. They are attacking us here in Europe. But we will not tolerate Bashar al-Assad as he is a mass murderer. He is a key cause of this problem. He is also a key cause of the problem of refugees who are running from him and from Daesh. So no cooperation with Assad or with Khamenei or Rouhani. No cooperation with Islamic fundamentalists and their allies. And we will not close our eyes to human rights violations in Iraq, especially by the brutal militias who are linked to Tehran, as Mr. Arouk said earlier. I've received many reports from different cities in Iraq where people complain that the Shia militias sponsored by the mullahs in Iran are committing many crimes that are every bit as bad as Daesh. So we call on Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi to expel the Iranian regime from Iraq, to disband the brutal militias affiliated with Iran. He should quickly reform the corrupted justice system he must jail Nuri al-Maliki and retrain the Iraqi military and police as a communal force involving all sections of Iraqi society. We have to give hope to the Sunni community and encourage them in the fight against Daesh. The majority of Sunnis are not extremists. They need to be treated humanely and then they themselves will kick out Daesh as they did with al-Qaeda several years ago. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, my dear brothers and sisters from Iraq, we were greatly encouraged when Hyder al-Abadi became Prime Minister and spoke of the need for reforms. But again, as John O'Rourke said this morning, we need to see these reforms in action. I'm very concerned about the fate of Iraq. Daesh has to be defeated. But we have to make sure that the Iranian regime does not exploit this conflict to advance its destructive influence. Iran is not part of the solution. It has been a source of the problem in both Iraq and Syria for years. Thank you very much, Mr. President.